Diet sweeteners include sugar alcohols like xylitol, sorbitol, and erythritol. Humans absorb xylitol more slowly than sucrose and has 40% fewer calories compared to sucrose. Now, sucrose is the table sugar, so sucrose molecule is literally a fusion of one glucose molecule and one fructose molecule combined together to form one molecule, and that's what's known as sucrose. Now, when ingested at high doses, xylitol and other polyol sugars, they typically cause gastrointestinal discomfort, so things like upset stomach and diarrhea. It also puts people at higher risk for kidney stones, which, by the way, xylitol is extremely toxic to dogs. Sorbitol, which is very similar to xylitol, is another sugar alcohol. And because it actually causes diarrhea pretty frequently, it's actually considered to be a laxative. Erythritol is found naturally in many fruits and vegetables and has about 70% of the sweetness of sugar. It's artificially made for mass production, and it's very close to being zero calorie. and doesn't cause any tooth decay. Now, since 1990, erythritol has been considered safe for use as a sweetener and a flavor enhancer in many food and beverage products. With that said, there's no firm accepted daily intake, or ADI, set by the European Food Safety Authority, or the FDA, which does consider erythritol generally recognized as safe, GRAS. But keep in mind that the FDA did once consider trans fats as generally recognized as safe for years, up until 2015. Scientists have assessed doses for erythritol where symptoms of mild gastrointestinal upset occurred, such as upset stomach and diarrhea. Now, the gastrointestinal symptoms occur less frequently when compared to xylitol and sorbitol. Erythritol is also the largest ingredient by weight in many natural stevia and monk fruit products. Recent investigations suggest that there's a relationship between more than 30 grams of erythritol consumption and an increased risk of heart attack and stroke. So why is erythritol doing this? Well, this study showed that erythritol also appeared to be causing platelets in the blood to clot more easily. While clots can break off and travel to the heart, triggering a heart attack, or if it goes to the brain, a stroke, basically, if you think about it, in the coronary artery, there's a plaque there, and when that plaque breaks off or ruptures, it then travels downstream and then gets lodged in that smaller portion of the artery. And when it happens in the heart, it's a heart attack. When it happens in the brain, it's a stroke. In fact, in one part of the study, they took eight healthy volunteers and made them drink a beverage that contained 30 grams of erythritol, the amount that many people in the United States consume. It's basically the equivalent of eating a pint of keto ice cream. They then did blood tests over the next three days and looked at the erythritol levels in the blood and looked at how much their blood was clotting. Now, in these healthy volunteers, 30 grams of erythritol was actually enough to make blood levels of erythritol go up a thousandfold, and it remained well above the threshold necessary to trigger blood clotting for three days. This is the only study so far that's seen diet sweeteners linked with clotting problems. In fact, this discovery was actually an accident as the researchers were essentially casting a net trying to find chemicals in the blood that were elevated in people with increased risk for stroke and heart attack. So although this study did not yet prove that erythritol causes heart attack and stroke, the results were so eye-opening that it was enough to sound the alarm on this chemical, very similar to what happened with trans fats when we thought those were once safe. But what about other diet sweeteners like saccharin, aspartame, sucralose, ACE-K, monk fruit extract, and even stevia? We don't know if they're increasing the clotting risk or increasing the risk of a heart attack or stroke or death, at least not yet anyway. But we do know some other things about them, and they all have been linked to health issues. The effects of substituting diet sweeteners for sugar has been looked at in several studies, and the evidence shows that they're actually correlated with metabolic syndrome. So far, there haven't been any long-term studies that have proved anything, but many of them have been found to hurt our gut health and have a correlation with cancer, such as with aspartame. Now, aspartame was well studied in animal models, and it's had profound negative effects on oxidative stress and inflammation. These health concerns were ignored by the European Food Safety Authority, the EFSA. The EFSA turned a blind eye to all 73 studies that showed the harmful effects of aspartame while accepting 84% of the studies that showed no harm. Then there was this, a study looking at the association with cancer. Specifically, they looked at over 100,000 people in France who consumed artificial sweeteners and accounted for other variables such as age, smoking status, and more. They then compared that group 
to those who didn't consume artificial sweeteners. And the verdict? Well, in this large cohort study, artificial sweeteners, especially aspartame and ACE-K, were associated with an increased cancer risk, about a 13% increased risk. Whenever you're doing a nutritional study, they're usually done with people recalling what they've consumed, but people forget, especially about things that they think aren't good for them. So you'll see a lot of nutritional studies that can conclude nothing more than correlation or association and rarely causation. Now, in order to determine causation in research, you need one of two kinds of studies. One is a randomized controlled trial, which is the gold standard for a drug or vaccine evaluation. But nutritional studies are notoriously hard to control for because when doing a prospective study, meaning you do an intervention and then you see what happens, it's hard to alter people's diets for any length of time. So what's the other kind of nutritional study that can prove causation? It's called an econometric analysis. This is how it was proven that smoking tobacco caused lung cancer. It's also how sugar was proven to cause type 2 diabetes. These studies analyze changes in disease rates over time, taking into account coexisting variables, and then using statistical analyses to draw conclusions. But these studies, as well as randomized controlled trials, they're complex with lots of factors or variables that you really can't control for. So the way that you try to overcome that is by having large numbers in these studies and having multiple studies. Now check out this study, which entailed four groups of people. They all ate a normal diet for six months, but the group was divided into four smaller groups. One group drank a liter of sugared soda per day. Another group drank a liter of diet soda per day. The third group drank a liter of milk per day and the last group drink a liter of water per day. As expected, the group that drank the sugary drinks, the soda, they gained weight, 22 pounds. The diet soda group gained three and a half pounds and the milk group stayed the same. The water group lost four and a half pounds. So while gaining three and a half pounds in the diet soda group is much better than the 22 pounds in the sugar soda group, they still gained weight despite eating the same amount of calories. And the milk has as many calories as the sugared soda so why didn't they gain weight? Well, it's because the fat and the lactose in the milk does not trigger the same kind of insulin release as the artificial sweetener. Now, how about this study that converted diet soda drinkers into water drinkers? They lost six pounds. Water and diet sweeteners have the same amount of calories, zero. So why did the water drinkers lose six pounds? It's because of different insulin responses. This study looked at 17 morbidly obese adults who did not have diabetes the researchers were specifically looking at insulin in response to carbonated beverages. They compared insulin responses between diet sodas and seltzer, which does not have any artificial sweetener in it. The insulin response to the diet soda was 20% higher compared to the seltzer. There are some other reasons why artificial sweeteners are generally unhealthy. For example, diet soda doesn't have any fiber in it. Generally speaking, more diet soda consumption leads to less fiber consumption, especially when it comes to the insoluble fiber. And this likely leads to changes in the gut microbiome and not for the better. In this scenario, the bad bacteria claim more and more of the gut territory, eventually eroding the mucin layer of the lining of the gut, causing microscopic leaks there, allowing pro-inflammatory chemicals to seep into the bloodstream, which then promotes metabolic syndrome and fat deposition. In addition to that, the intestinal bacteria influences the brain senses, including the sensation of feeling hungry or full. Some studies suggest that certain diet sweeteners may have insulin-like properties of their own, contributing to fat deposition. Overall, drinking artificial sweeteners is probably better than drinking sugar soda, but still much worse compared to drinking water, especially when it comes to insulin resistance, diabetes, and obesity. So while the studies we have so far don't prove causation of either metabolic syndrome or even cancer, it's definitely hard to ignore the correlations, especially because obesity and metabolic syndrome continue to be so prevalent despite an overall decrease in sugar consumption. If I were to recommend one sweetener, it would be monk fruit extract, which is natural sweetener, it's zero calories. It seems to be very safe, although there's very limited studies on it. So if you do go with it, just make sure to uh, do so in moderation. The bottom line is that it's best to avoid sugary beverages as well as diet sweeteners. And if you have a sweet tooth, stick to whole fruit, since the whole fruit has fiber in it, which helps to mitigate the effects of that sucrose in that fruit.